welcome to Journey TV. I'm your host, Yvette Craddock. Journey TV is a series of programs dedicated to exploring cultural diversity in the corridor. Each episode features the personal stories of local residents who share their challenges and contributions to enrich the corridor's cultural climate. They share their stories with the intention that we collectively increase our understanding, acceptance, tolerance, and respect for each other. Their personal stories may be their individual journeys, but their individual journeys represent those of many. We are the many. She's the type of girl that immediately catches your eye and quickly thereafter captures your heart. Her vivacious spirit, captivating smile, and personable warmth greet everyone she meets. As the youngest of three siblings, her two older brothers protected her like a hawk and her parents made sure that she remained their little girl for as long as possible. Her creativity has guided her. Her thirst for life drives her. Cedar Rapids is her home. As a grown woman, she is doing her part to make her home everyone's home. I lived in Cedar Rapids my whole life. My childhood was fun. My brothers dragged me across the carpet on my back and like get the rug burns and you know like just typical brothers. What kind of things would you do with your friends growing up? We would always change our shoes so like everyone would wear everyone else's shoes like one foot had like your shoe and then the other one was someone else's shoe and like you would just we thought we were the so cool and like we'd <laughs> you know collect chapsticks together and like oh my god I got this flavor and like um, it was just we were just crazy I guess. It didn't seem like I had a care in the world. Most people can relate to Rima as Ram Salim's childhood filled with typical sibling antics, silly games with friends, and not having a care in the world. Really, normal childhood stuff, up to a point. We're not allowed to date in our religion. It's against our religion. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, even if guys were to talk to me at school, they'd be like, who's that? Who are, you, who are you talking to? What are you doing? Or like, even when I got married, my brothers still have a problem with me being married in a sense. Really? Yeah. You're, oh, they're really protective. You're their little sister. Especially one in particular. How was that growing up when you couldn't date? Did you feel pressure or, or were people understanding and respectful of your religious beliefs? I felt like people didn't really understand. Like they thought I was just like this weird girl who didn't mm -hmm. belong. Like I didn't fit mm -hmm. in because everyone else was dating and like ha going to parties and like having fun with friends after school. Like I come home after school. I you know, like my parents were very strict on, you know, you're not allowed to sleep at anyone else's house because it's not appropriate for a girl to sleep out of the house until she's married, you know, like in her own home. Okay. Um, and so like people, like I didn't go to parties and so people will just thought I was just so, even like more than a nerd, I guess you can say, like why is she always home? Like why doesn't she ever go out? Why doesn't she ever drink? Why doesn't she ever do any of that stuff? But they never understood completely why. Mm -hmm. And so I was always the outcast, compared to everyone. Like I just never fit into that category with anybody. How did that make you feel? It hurt, it hurt because they didn't, I didn't feel like they wanted to understand. They didn't want to learn why I couldn't do certain things. Sure. And then I was so tired of like them asking, um, like, oh, this boy asked you out, why didn't you go out with him? Or why didn't you go to the prom? Or like, why didn't you, I was like, by the end I was like, why? Like seriously? Ah, did I mention the obvious? Rima is Muslim. She chooses to wear the traditional headscarf or hijab. She has spent her life working to better understand others, despite others intentionally not really exerting any desire or effort to understand her as a person, and more specifically, a Muslim woman. The one part of her story that most can sadly understand is what it feels like to be ostracized, marked as an outsider for any reason, and in her case, most poignantly for her religious and cultural beliefs. Did those experiences bring you to the point where you are now from the standpoint of being outspoken and educating people 
about your religious beliefs and your culture? I think so. Like, I mean, I got involved with the 9-11 memorial last year. Mm -hmm. um, and, but even before then, I really wanted to um, inspire act, um, anchoring, like being in broadcast journalism. Yes, yes. And I really wanted to um, get Islam on a good foot. Islam is not a bad religion. There's bad people in every religion. That was really my dream. I really wanted to help people understand what Islam really is. And so then I finally got the chance to at the 9-11 memorial. From the reactions that I got, that I figured like this is kind of what I want to do. Be able to explain to people where I came from being growing up as a Muslim girl, like not covering my head mm -hmm. um, at the beginning and then after marriage, like covering my head and then kind of like realizing the hatred that I'm feeling more so, like mm -hmm. after I wore the headscarf. What was the defining moment for you? What was your point where you noticed a major shift. Right after 9-11 happened, I was in sixth grade and like people just started being so rude to me. And like they just started calling me like a terrorist and I don't belong here. And like they, you know, like they kept saying like, oh, there's probably something like you're hiding in your like pa pockets of your jeans or something. Like you're probably holding guns. Like where are your guns, Rima? And like all that stuff. I'm like, okay. Now, are these people you've and known and went to school with yeah. all these years? Yep. And so like it was just, it was different for me. Like, it just hurt. Her hurt is still real. I lost friends. Um, like, one girl, she saw me wearing the headscarf, like, you know, right after mm -hmm. I wore it. And she's like, why are you wearing that? I'm like, oh, because of my religion. And I wanted to. And then I, she stopped talking to me. It's called a hijab. I feel like they're threatened by, the, by me wearing it, in a sense. I started wearing it three weeks after I got married, actually. Which was in um, September 20th, 2010. So I started wearing it October 12th of that year, of 2010. Fear is as contagious as an airborne disease that needs to be mitigated. Imagine going through life as a well-liked child and then one day waking up to people you know and have known your entire life making false, hateful accusations against you. She has worked to heal her pain and emerge stronger and as an outspoken leader. As any true leader, her strength is in her core. Her attitude is her asset. She has weathered the insensitive behavior of others midpoint through her childhood through today. As an adult, she retains her playful essence with newfound wisdom and maturity. Her family has faithfully stood by her side the entire way. All work, and when we come home, we all see each other and, and, and have a good time with the, with the kids and everybody. And I think a religion, it's, it does play a lot of role with our life. We pray together, we, we talk about religion a lot of time, we see a lot of uh, uh, religious shows, and you know, in, 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 this, in this age, you have to be close to your family, to your kids. And you have to explain to them about life, about you know what's going on outside and if they have any problem you know you have to help them to uh, take care of it instead leave them by themselves and see what happened later you know the first mosque in north america is in cedar rapids iowa mother mosque yes called, yes right? and there's thousands now of, mo of mosques in the u.s and when i came in 1980 to this country um it was like uh, life was easier for some reason and there is not too much prejudice, you know, uh, against Muslim or any other religion. But 9-11 evoked those problems that we are facing right now. We are just people like anybody else. Yes. We are no different. We believe in the same God. Uh, we, we love life. We uh, love our children. We just want to have successful uh, businesses. That's all that we want, you yeah. know, just like anybody else. We want to be happy. We want to live peaceful. If you go in, in the communities, there's no issues. It's the 1% uh, ignorant people that we have. So, I think it helps. So I have neighbors, for example, and we're good friends with them and teaching them. We have a, we, we, I had a really good neighbor that I was a good friend with, and she moved away to a small town, and I said, in a small town, they need to be educated. And so I was good to her. Hopefully she'll pass on the message. We're not getting a lot of help from the media, you know. Maybe sometimes, you know, we try to work harder, but the media, sometimes they come and, you know, and, and be a little bit hard on us. This we should show it, you know, if we're doing something, helping a community in a tragedy like, 
like the flood here in Sidi Rabis. Yes. But we had most of the community, they were going from home to home to help other people to clean their houses. But we don't show ourselves like hey, we are the Muslim community doing that. We have to start actually with our leaders. Um, mm -hmm. Imams, uh, you know, rabbis, um, ministers, uh, uh, professors, uh, government, anybody, that we have to start educating them to educate the people around them. If they teach their group, if on Sunday they tell them we are equal and everybody should be equal, doesn't matter who they are, I'm not talking about only Muslims. Yes. Because there is a lot of prejudice against a lot of different people. Yes. We'll be okay. Every once in a while you, you get an ignorant somebody, you know, but it, he's not doing it on hate, you know, it's just, he say something or in ignorance and that. Yeah. It doesn't hurt us. We say, I feel sorry for him, you know. I'm very proud of her because how the community, uh, uh, you know, they treating her now and uh, everybody supporting her. All the Christian community and, and Jewish community and a mm -hmm. lot, lot of Indian, a lot of people, they love her because the way who she is and, and they, uh, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud to be her father. It is obvious that the Ajram family is a close-knit one. In order to work on achieving similarly positive experiences for everyone, education, communication, and proactive solutions are part of the answer. In the case of faith-based confusion or misunderstandings, the need for increased community education is a theme that Rima's family believes in, as well as the local Muslim leadership. In order to better understand the role the mosque plays in the Muslim community, I am at the Iowa City Mosque speaking to the president of the executive committee. Usainu Kita is joining me for this segment of Journey TV. I am the current president of the executive committee of the Iowa City Mosque. I'm the head of the education committee. Our main goal and role is to focus on the educations of our children in the community, meaning the Muslim children. We try our best to educate our children so that they get proper Islamic education while growing up in this Western society. We're also responsible for the general education of the community. If you know, we launch some programs in, in the mosque on a regular basis, weekly basis, lecture programs, the Dawa committee. Mm -hmm. Dawa means calling people, calling people to Islam. Basically, that's what it translates to. And the role of the Dawa committee is to invite people to Islam and do the best they can to better explain Islam to them rather than all the misconceptions they get out there as what Islam is supposed to be. You are involved in an interfaith group. Will you please explain to us the efforts that the community is making um, jointly mm -hmm. to educate um, members of congregations locally? We have this interfaith dialogue group which is called the Christian Muslim Dialogue Group. And we've been meeting for a while. We have monthly meetings where we sit and discuss some of the most daunting issues, I mean, in Christianity and Islam, and especially the, 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 the issues that we differ on. And it's been a very good group. We have a lot of members, pastors, mainly some professionals, and uh, we have a very good meeting and some very interesting conversation. What trends do you see as far as uh, multiple generations better accepting and showing respect of the differences in, in religious faith? Well, as we are all aware, unfortunately, the modern generation are not too religious, you know. I've been in France for two months, and in France, Catholicism was really, it's really big, or was really big, like as I can see. Everywhere you go, even small town, you find huge cathedrals. I mean, huge, beautiful, expensive cathedrals, but people are not religious anymore, you know. I tell people, you have all these cathedrals, they even celebrate, I mean, 
religious holiday, which is official state holidays, but religion is not in people's life. It's just a, something that is just there, but people are not participating. And so then it, it means that modern people are not being interested in, 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 in religion. Part of the reason is um, we, uh, I'll mention myself as religious leaders or who have responsibilities, we're not doing as well as we're supposed to do to involve the younger generation. Perhaps the declining interest in religion correlates to the lack of respect for those who practice a particular religion. The answers are not clear or easy, but they all lead to continuing dialogue and education. It's important to understand the female side of the Islamic faith. And with me right now is Fatima Mohammed, who is here to t share her experience as a Muslim woman in Eastern Iowa. You have a fascinating story, <laughs> one that I think people could relate to. Would you please give us a background of where you grew up? Well, I'm a country girl from Kansas. I grew up on the farm, riding, roping. I came to Islam 11 years ago, but it was a long journey. I first became interested when I was 13, and there's just something about it stuck with me as a girl. And of course, I went on, did my life like the typical American girl, and you know, had my life, had my children. But it started coming back to me, and I started thinking about it. Behind the conceptions you hear in public about what Islam is all about, you know, the same stories I read in the Quran are the same stories I grew up with in the Bible and church. Um, it was a more clear, and it's, it gave me the discipline I needed, and it just was in my heart. It's something that reached out to me and said, this is what you need to do, what you wanted. You've put God first above everything else. There's no body but God. And he's the same name. If you go to the Middle East, you go to a Christian church, they're going to say Allah, because that's the Arabic word for God. And that word existed before the English language was created. It's just a misconception. People think, oh, it's a different God. It's not. It's the one God. And the rights of women, even though women are reputed to be so oppressed, and there are countries where it is, but that is definitely not the religion, that is the culture. There are cultures who do, and in fact, many of the problems we have in our community is when the women are, we're trying to give them their rights, we don't want to do that. We want to do it the old way. We want to sit behind a curtain and be hidden from the men. And it's like, why? Right. You know, you don't have to do this. Mm -hmm. And it comes to Judgment Day, men and women are equal. After 9-11, People beg me not to cover my hair. Well, I'm stubborn. I'm not going to do what they tell me. I covered my hair with pride. There were communities, a community in Minnesota in which all the community women handed out scarves and everybody, it didn't matter who, put on scarf to kind of stand up for the Muslim women. So nobody knew, are you a Muslim or not a Muslim? And it was a beautiful show of the community for the Muslim women. I had one instance I did get kind of a beat up, but that was, you know, ignorance, ignorance mm. on the part of a group of young men. And mostly the communities reached out and accepted me. I've had people accuse me of being a nun because I cover my hair. <laughs> One thing about a Muslim is if you need something, they will help you. Anybody can come here and say, I'm suffering, and they'll take you in, they'll help you. You know, they're not requiring, okay, you have to do this if we want to help you. If you need something, they'll be there for you. Uh, charity uh, is one of the major pillars of Islam. Um, I couldn't imagine myself not giving something to someone who needed. If they're hungry, I'll feed you. When you see inside the heart of a Muslim, if you look at it from person to person rather than seeing the conception people have about the religion, they're beautiful people. As a University of Iowa communication studies student, Rima is intent on changing the homogenous media landscape and continuing to educate people about her religious and cultural beliefs. I came here and I just started wearing the scarf, like the hijab, like three months before I started the university. 
And so coming here and I had to adjust to being a university student instead of Kirkwood and like, mm -hmm. you know, just the class sizes and everything like that. Mm -hmm. But then I also had to adjust to like people staring at me more mm -hmm. because I wasn't used to it before. But then as my semesters went on, I'm like, I, start, I stopped paying attention to it. Like it doesn't phase me anymore. So I'm just trying to get like finished communication, my communication studies degree. And then hopefully like I would love to be an anchor. Yes. Um, and work for Good Morning America one day. I know that's like a big dream, but I would, I mean, that's one of my biggest dreams that I would love to do. Everybody has to dream big. Yeah, Anyone maybe. who has accomplished their life goals, they've dreamed big. They've gone way beyond their own comfort zone and have avoided the constraints of society, whether it's direct friends and direct comments, and they focused on that goal. Right. So that's completely plausible for you to accomplish. Thanks. <laughs> what are you willing to do to make it happen? If it comes down to you choosing to wear your hijab or not? I will wear it. Like my religion comes first. Even if I don't get the job that I, you know, I love, I mean, I'm understanding that that's going to happen. You know, I'm not stupid by it because I know that a lot of people are um, very close-minded when it comes to Islam and people are afraid mm -hmm. and so like I would understand like if um, they weren't ex ready to like have a Muslim um, anchor or whatever but that's okay I'll try again I'll try until like I succeed in the place and like they accept me for who I am and I don't have to change people like change myself to fit people's needs I do understand that so you will stand with conviction behind your decisions sure. and make it happen sure. regardless but your religion does come first. Right, I'll over. just work my, you know, like harder than people expect of me. You know what I mean? I'll work harder than that and I'll try to um, work beyond that to mm -hmm. get like where I want to be. Do you have a plan of action for how you can help those in the TV industry become more accepting of not only you, but others who are different? I wanted to go into the news to like portray like portray being different is okay you know mm -hmm. like portraying that racism is not okay like I, I that's what I wanted to do like I wanted to um, show that Islam and like other religions or like other people are like there's good people in everything and there's also bad people with every religion every color and like everything so I mean I hope I can inspire change in a sense when I'm talking to them sure. or like when I'm there working for some company. I hope I can inspire people to like have a more open mind towards other people. Regardless of our diverse religious beliefs, the ultimate goal and behavior and mindset of people from all religious and faith-based backgrounds can be found in the response by some audience members to Rima's 9-11 speech. They stood up a few times and they gave me like standing ovations a few times. Wonderful. Yeah, and, I'm, and they didn't do that for any other speaker. And so I'm like, oh my God, I'm like sitting there. I didn't realize what was going on until after the fact. Sure. So like my family was telling me like, oh my God, they stood up like three, four times during your speech. Like they were really like giving you a standing ovation. I was like, really? And they kept clapping afterwards and they were just, I mean, like people came up to me, they were crying, um, you know, hugging Aww. me. And they're like, people I didn't know were apologizing to me about treating us so badly. Wow. Like, I'm sorry I've tr treated you this way. And like, I now that you opened my eyes, like I realize that you guys are normal people. Like, there's no reason for us to have like this hatred towards you. Although we may not agree on the same way to worship God, by whatever name we choose to bestow upon him, we can all work together to walk the same spiritual path lined with respect, acceptance, tolerance, and peace as a united group in the human experience.
it is not just about the financial things, it is more than that. It is about what Cedar Rapids is offering me, what Iowa provides me. Relocation was specifically for the position. I wanted to be in Iowa. Their reasons for moving to the corridor vary, but every day their numbers are increasing. Who are they? They are the millennials and our future. The corridor's ability to attract, recruit, and retain them is paramount to stopping the brain drain. Put yourself in the other person's shoes. Going that extra mile. I don't have any children, they all have children, so trying to find someone who doesn't have children to hang out with. Sure. You know, I don't have any kids, so that part of it as well too can be challenging <laughs> to hang out with somebody, because yeah. I have a lot more free time than they may have as well too. I think there are a few things being done about this, but being letting people know about those opportunities, I think, is something that the corridor could work on. Since we've been born, we don't know the peace. Only the peace maybe when we are here. Esai Toinger and his wife Bridget are originally from Chad, Africa. The country of Chad has been a bloody battleground for decades. Although its bloodshed and revolt is akin to Rwanda, very little is publicized about the Chad civil wars. Uh, the war it started uh, in the north of Chad uh, because uh, uh, it was people of the north that uh, went to the rebellion and uh, it took some years from 1965 until 1982 before, uh, even before that there was peace agreement that they came out and then uh, in, uh, they prepared themselves and the war started in Jamena. That is where um, it affected all the areas. And then in 1982, uh, the war reached our area. We were from south. And uh, it was, um, I don't know if uh, you heard about uh, Black September, but even in Chad, they talk about Black September. That is a horrific moment. Many prays, uh, churches, many people have been killed. They burned them alive, and uh, it was a b bad moment. A sigh in Bridget's sadness is palpable. The scars of repeated personal loss from the war are still etched on their hearts. They use us uh, to fight others, and uh, it was a hard moment, but I was blessed that uh, I escape and uh, through the way that I escape, I don't know, but uh, uh, it's God that helped me through those uh, hard moments. I, I had 15 Naira, which would be maybe two or three cents USA. That was the only money that uh, I had. Mm -hmm.